Thanks a lot. Let's keep going. So the whole idea here is to talk about extended events. Um, the basics are not hard. Um, the core is pretty simple. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in slides. We're going to go and play with extended events. I mean, it's just largely what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how to use them, how to use them effectively, because the fact is, is that when they came out in 2008, um, the easiest way to describe it is they sucked. Uh, they were just bad. The, the GUI was poor, the um, non-existent, sorry, I used the word, wrong word, non-existent. There was no GUI at all. And um, the events themselves were not quite cooked. There were a few little gotchas in 2008 that didn't work. And the output was all XML. And so a lot of people evaluated it in 2008, went, oh my God, this is heinous, and never looked again. And the problem is, is that technology being what it is, hey, look, it's 2020. It isn't 2008 anymore. Things have changed. What we knew as extended events in 2008 was bad. What became extended events in 2012 and has continued to improve and expand in radical ways in the last you know, eight years is totally, totally different. And so what I want to do is reintroduce all of you who have spent 12 years hating on extended events to extended events. And then we're going to put them to work because they do great things, things you can't do any other way. And that's the whole goal here. Now, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Um, this is my contact information. After today, if you've got questions, I want to try to help out. Uh, you've got my Twitter handle. You've got my email address. You've got my blog. Um, track me down ask me questions. I want to help. Um, if it's about extended events, great. Let's talk. If it's about query tuning, awesome. Let's talk. If it's about execution plans, I'm going to send you to Hugo. No, no, kidding. Um, I will recommend Hugo, but I'll, I'll help you. Let's talk. Or if you want to talk DevOps or Redgate, let's do that. Um, I'm, I'm really, really ready to help out. So you've got the contact information. You've got a personal invite right now to use it. Take advantage of it. Use it. Let me, let me help out if I can. So why extended events? Um, I already talked to you about the 2008 to 2012 story and how they, they really revamped everything. They changed it all. But here's the big one for me. It's built right into the engine. Now, Profiler, when it was built way, way back in 1998, and yeah, it's that old. It's 1998 it was put together. It was glued onto the side. It was not a fundamental core of the engine itself. They had some hooks and stuff that they managed to use, but it really was sort of this, you know, horrible Rube Goldberg device attached to SQL Server. And it shows. It's got a, a lot of overhead, way more than this does, because this in extended events is running inside the SQL OS. It is built into the code. It is a aspect of the code so that you can run this stuff with a radically reduced load. Note, radically reduced, not zero. There's still a cost associated with these. Can you add too many extended events? Yes. Can you add too many functions in and around the extended events? Yes. Can you, you know, load up a firearm, chamber around, aim it at body parts and hurt them? Yes. You know what? Don't do that right? It, it Don't do that. But fundamental behaviors inside of extended events work. And they work because they're built into the OS. And what it means is, is that trace, for example, will capture every event that you tell it to capture. And then if you say, hey, wait a minute, I only want database A, it will go, wait, is this database A? No, it's database B. Okay, well, I'll throw that away. Now, I'll already have used all the resources to capture that event. And I'll do the same thing for database CDE uh, through QQ22. I mean, it will capture all of the events and use up all the resources. Whereas, because extended events is built into the engine, it actually filters at the low level, therefore using fewer resources because it filters early and often and efficiently. That's a huge, huge win. So that in a nutshell is one of the big drivers for me in why I would want to use extended events. Another reason why I want to use extended events is 
all the new functionality. Now I know that most people, not everyone, but most people have most of their servers on 2012 or above. And the reason being is because you're using column store, you're using adaptive joins, you're using um, um, availability groups, you're using all of the new functionality that's been introduced since 2012. Guess what? None, zero, none of that can be monitored through trace because they've not added a trace event since 2008. Trace is, is effectively a dead product, whereas extended events is living, growing, breathing. Tracy's got a book out on Query Store. Guess what you use to monitor Query Store? Tracy, what do you use to monitor Query Store? Extended events. <gasps> extended events. <laughs> wow. And don't forget, cool? Grant wrote part of the book as well. <laughs> well, yeah, but anyway, the, you're using extended events. Further, Extended Events has got a bunch of unique functionality. We're going to cover some of that today. So that's the why of Extended Events, right? It, it's, it's better technology at a lower level within the OS, re-engineer, better engineering. It is all the new functionality and it has capabilities that frankly aren't possible easily. You could do almost anything with trace and trace data, but easily take trace and do stuff. You know, not write all kinds of massive programs and run through all these crazy things, but easily put it to work. This just is better. And we're gonna, we're gonna go through why and how. Now, where can you use it? Frankly, don't, don't use it in 2008 or 2008 R2, just don't, just don't. Just, it's not there. Even though it's there, it's not there. Just pretend it doesn't exist. If you're running 2008 or less, of course you're going to use trace. Done, right? No discussion, no judgment. There's no call. But if you're running 2012 or better, not only do you not have any excuses to not run this, it's causing less impact on your systems. It's a lighter load you are being a more responsible database developer, database administrator, data whatever, by using this stuff than by using 22 year old technology that has been deprecated out of the product because it has overhead, not as good as this, right? I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. Also, if you're an Azure SQL database, guess what you do not have at all? No trace. So you're going to be using this. Um, just reemphasizing though, if you're on 2008 or less, what well, one, time to upgrade really is, but two, don't even try. Everybody cool with that? Are there any outstanding questions coming through? Um, somebody mentioned that Jonathan Cahayas had written a interface for 2008, if they remember correctly. There, yeah, there was an interface that Jonathan Cahayas wrote for 2008, but there was still and not I am not critiquing Jonathan when I say this there were a whole bunch of shortcomings with trait with extended events itself and and Jonathan could not overcome those um, and so while his work was amazing right and, and top-notch and, and fully you know my god you know like this but but the problems were with extended events and so no matter how much good work he did it was overwritten by the bad work that we were looking at in 2008. So, I mean, I, I just, I would just avoid it with 2008. Um, if there's no other questions, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> and, and we're done. Yay. Now I got, I got about two more slides at the end of the day. We're, but other than that, we're going to um, go to and play with extended events. It's the best way to learn it. It's just to get in there and dig around and play with it. So let's talk about it. First up, I was told, um, and this one's stupid, and I freely admit this is a dumb demo. But I was told that running Profiler is easy because it's click, click, boom, way too much information. Okay, well, okay, so with Management Studio um, 18 that I'm on here, um, click, I'm going to double click, boom, too much information. Um, I've got everything that you're going to need because these two things right down here, that are built in, it says X event profiler. Um, this is extended events, 
But what it's doing is, is it's opening up and running profiler. So if we run a query here and let's just run one. Oh, doggone it. We have to be connected up to the database. What? Who said that? Hang on. And it will fail because we're not in the right database. All right, there we go. Now we run a query and you can see that there's queries going by. Okay, so click, click, too much information. I'm unimpressed with profiler because I can get profiler level information, but honest to God, the extended events is not a replacement for profiler. That's trivial. Let's dig into it and start looking at it. First off, if we're going to go into it and create it, we have new session wizard and new session. Don't bother with the new session wizard. It has only one thing that the new session window does not have, and I will show you what that is not. There's one button missing down here at the bottom, and that button is the next button. There is no next button here. So the wizard has a next button, this does not. Also, there is a little bit of a bug. It doesn't open the window up all the way. So I generally have to drag it open because there's one other little property down here we don't want to miss out on, causality tracking. The basic idea here is simple. We're in group by, so we'll just use group by as our name, our session name, and then we've got templates. Now I was asked this question um, the today, this morning on another session I was doing on extended events, believe it or not. Um, I was asked, hey, is there anything that profiler does or trace does that extended events does not? And it used to be, there used to be two, and that was playback and um, the ability to take a trace events file and a um, performance monitor file and marry the two. Right now, if you'll notice, T SQL replay, dun, 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 we can capture it here. And you know, it even says profiler equivalence. So we can capture it here and then let the playback run um, through, through the playback mechanisms. So we can actually get away with using this now. We don't have to use the, um, the old tools anymore. The only thing left is that perfmon thing. Can't do that. Oh, well. But you've got all of these templates available. So you can go in here, grab one of these templates, use one of these templates, and off you go. These work. They're great. There's nothing wrong with them. I'm going to walk you through all the details on setting up your own tra uh, your own um, uh, sessions, but you can just use those. Now, the other options we have here is we can say, hey, you know what? Every time the server re restarts, make sure that this event, this session is running. Some of the monitoring sessions you can set up. For example, there is a way to monitor for the common errors of SQL injection, as an example, using extended events and maybe that's a good one to have restart every time you restart the server. Just say it. But you can do that. We can say start the session immediately after the session creation and we can watch live data on the screen as it's captured. Not we are going to do. We also have this ability to track how events are related to one another. We're going to get around to that. We're not going to deal with that right now. But that's it is the basic session properties. That's it. It's all you got to do. Set those. Give it a name. Pick a template or don't. Um, and then set up how it's going to start. I do not want this one to start at server startup though, but we're going to turn that off. And that's it. That's all you got to do. Now there is no next button. So you have to go over here to the left where you've got these four pages and select a page. That was hard. Sorry. Now what we've got is all of the various types of events. They're all listed out here and it is a long list. You can see going on and on and on. There's a lot of stuff and it's all new functionality, all the old functionality, the stuff you expect to see like um, RPC completed, SQL batch completed, all that fun stuff. But it's also all kinds of new things. Um, let's start right at the top and talk about this one. Adaptive join skipped. If an adaptive join is not possible and there's a reason why the optimizer said, hey, I can't do an adaptive join. Look at that, it can tell you. You can actually monitor for things like that. If you don't know what adaptive joins are, track down me, track down Hugo, um, track down a few other people. We will tell you what they are because they're cool. But anyway, that's one thing that you could do right from right here is just pick that one thing and off you go. And it, the nice thing about each of these is, is that the, the ones that are well-written, not all of them are well-written. There's nothing perfect here, but, um, the nice ones are well written. They tell you exactly what it is. This occurs when a query 
tries to get more memory grant during execution, failure to get this additional memory, blah, 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 blah. Cool, I've got that full thing. I've got all of the event fields that take place and I've got a description of each of the fields so I can see all the data about each of the events and about each of the fields and it's all laid out and actually it's not the prettiest, fanciest interface, but it's a simple and easy to use interface. Now, if we're looking for something like, let's just, let's stick to query tuning, make it simple query tuning. Um, SQL batch complete, SQL batch, oh, there it is, SQL batch completed. And of course we have SQL batch starting and all kinds of other stuff, but SQL batch complete occurs when a transaction batch has finished executing and it gives us all of the different um, event fields. And by the way, each event comes with its own unique set of event fields. You do not go into this little column picker thing like you used to do. It's nice and simple. If I got the one I want, I'm gonna click right and off it goes. Now we can clear this. We can search for it in, in ways that we want to, event names and descriptions, event fields only if you're looking for a particular field. You can just track through all of it and find stuff as you want to. It makes it easier to set things up. Further, there's categories. So you could say, you know, we'll turn off all the categories and just give me information about automatic tuning or just give me information about the checkpoint or just give me, you know, information about um, deadlocks, right? Deadlock monitor. You know, you can make these choices or you can filter by channel. Now, how often do I filter by channel? Never. I more or less leave them all on. I might filter by category to track things down, but the channel thing doesn't really matter except for this one bit, debug. There are a whole bunch of debug events, probably something you should avoid. You'll notice it's off by default. I would leave it off. I would not recommend turning it on. Um, and the reason being, it can put your server into debug depending on the event. So um, unless you're prepared for messing up your production machine, I would not do that. Uh, you know, or maybe you're getting ready to quit and you've just decided to, to burn it all to the ground. That might be a good way to go. Regardless, the whole thing is actually run through what are called packages. And this is the way Microsoft describes it. It's like, well, you have a package and the package defines all this. And, and I just like, don't worry about that. There's these sessions, the sessions have events. So let's pick another event. Let's just pick RPC completed. Again, easy to find, quick, simple, not hard. We'll write and off it goes. And these now are my two events that I've selected. See, it's that sad easy. Here's where it gets a little weird. And I'm not crazy about this aspect of the GUI. I then click configure. And it brings me to a whole new little screen that was hidden before. And yes, on the wizard, you get next, next, next. And you can see some of these screens laid out easily. But I don't need that wizard. Um, I don't need the next button. I just need to know that that little configure button gets me over to here. And you want to be over here because of two really important things and then one slightly less important thing. The two important things are actions and predicates. The less important thing are the event fields. And let me just cover this real quickly. By default, as I said, there's each event has a set of fields. So this is for the fields for the SQL batch complete and you'll see a different set of, of fields for the RPC complete cool, right? It makes logical sense. RPC complete has got object name because what's RPC completed is based off stored procedures and or prepared statements. Um, but it's got the name of the object. So you're gonna have that with you. Whereas batch is all about batches and therefore it's just a batch. It's just a batch text. So no object name. Okay, cool. R logical sense, no, no confusion there. But you'll notice a couple of these things have got check boxes. Some are on by default, such as the statement here or the batch text here. And that means that those things are on by default. The other ones are off by default. If there's a checkbox next to it, it's optional, which is cool. Because what it does is it gives you another way to reduce your overhead. Now let's imagine for a moment, what you want to do is let's capture just a count of executions of a given store procedure. Okay, cool. If I'm just capturing a count, do I need to capture the statement that defines the store procedure call, including the parameter values, by the way. There's there's an old rumor and, and it, well, it's not a rumor, it's based on the 2008 implementation. In 2008, 
it didn't capture the statement uh, for some of the calls and you had to do other things. It was very convoluted and crazy. They fixed it in 2012. It captures the statement, which includes the parameter values. So yes, parameter values are included with stored procedure calls, as long as you're capturing the statement. But what if you don't need it and you're just capturing counts? Turn it off, reduce the overhead, reduce the data management, cool. Or conversely, what if you are using output parameters and you would like to see that data? Okay, cool, we can turn that on. What if you are using data stream and you would like to see that data? Cool, you could turn that on. So there are optional things that you can set. Most of the time, do you need to go to the screen? Nope, probably the default values for a given event are exactly what you need and you're done. Now the next field, I'm gonna kind of go in reverse order because I can, doesn't matter. The next field is the predicate. The predicates are easy to understand. It's a where clause. It's that easy. You can set it for each one of the set of the um, events in your session. So each event can have its own predicate. Cool. Or you can select multi-select, control click or shift click, and then set predicates for all of the events in a given thing. Now, the stuff you'll see here at the top if it's more than one, it's going to be all of the common values between those two. If it's just one, what's at the, oops, hang on, come on, let, there we go. If it's just one, what you're going to see at the top are all of the fields for that event, okay? We're gonna go back to selecting both. Then below that are package level information SQL OS level information, and then SQL server level information, all stuff that you can add as a filter. And so we're gonna do something really crazy like, oh, I don't know, database name. Um, that's an easy one, adventure works. Each of these fields can be expanded out to make them easier to see. You can mess with the column widths and stuff. It's actually doesn't retain things. There's actually a few glitches with the, with the GUI. It's not flawless, but we're not, most of the time we won't be using the GUI. Most of the time we'll be using T-SQL. However, learning it, the GUI is easier. Um, equal, greater than, less than, um, like, right? It's all in here. We can start doing um, you know, pretty much anything. Any, any kind of filtering we want to do. So however you want to set it up. Now you'll notice because I've added now a, 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 a predicate, it's changed right over here on this side of the screen. Oops. It's changed. And so I've got little check marks next to the filter image showing that I've added a predicate. Cool. That's just a great way to go. And by the way, even on the select screen now, that same screen is going to show you that predicate addition. Okay. Go back to configure and we'll talk about actions. Now I like to call them actions because that was the original definition name. And I think it's the one to remember. Global fields makes it sound way, way, way too happy. Um, and this is not entirely happy. Actions are additional bits of information you can collect on top of the event package itself. Whatever the event is going to capture, the fields it captures, you could add things like um, into username or query hash or query plan hash, all very attractive bits of information, right? You know, but you got to remember that these are what are called actions. Another way to think about the actions is not entirely the same, but, but it's the best way to think about them. Triggers, they're triggers. You're adding triggers. So these actions add some overhead. Now, do they add tons and tons of overhead? No, but like, what if we add SQL text as an action? Wait a minute, aren't we capturing already the statement and the batch? Why would we need to add SQL text? Well, in this case, you would not. Adding it in this case adds additional overhead that is wasted information. It's not gonna do anything for you and it's just gonna hurt your system. So let's not do that. Like hurting our system is a bad thing, right? Let's, let's not hurt the system. But some of them are useful and you probably are gonna to wanna to use them. Maybe you wanna add the query plan hash, right? Maybe you do wanna add the query hash. Those are nice things to have. Notice also that when you add them, you see the little lightning bolt, which is an action. 
and it gets a count of how many things have been added. And again, just like before, you can individually select these and add one of these and it, each one is individually added. So all we're doing right now is just filtering on database ID and other network capturing RPC complete, SQL batch complete, and we're good to go. Any questions so far? Uh, just one question. Um, is there any performance impact to watching the data live in extended events? Great question. So in Profiler, if you turn on Profiler to watch what I used to call SQL TV, because I used to do this, I would turn on production server and just sit there and watch it go by. And because I was ignorant, um, <laughs> but um, Tracy's laughing at that. me. Tracy, <laughs> I watched the server go down because they did this at a place I worked at. So that's okay, I, well, I was going to say she's laughing at me because she knows how bad that was. I didn't yes. know at the time. Here's the deal, Trace. When you fire up that GUI and connect it out to a production server, it creates a secondary buffering mechanism in support of the GUI. And that buffer takes place on the server. Does that happen here? Nope. Nope, 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 nope. But is there overhead for, from observing with this tool? Yes, but it is radically reduced, one. And two, depending on how you do it, it can be reduced down to near zero. Um, if you're capturing, and, and this does almost set up my next thing, it depends on your data storage. So we're going to go to that and then I'll come back around to, to that full answer. Okay. Everybody cool? All right. That was the only question. All right. So data storage, we have to add a target and we have a choice of targets. Now our targets are um, sync target, which I've never used. I'd have to look up what that is to, to really understand. The event counter target, which is to go out to a performance monitor events. If you want to do that, you can. I haven't figured out a reason why I would do that, but you could do it. Event file. This is the one I would suggest for most of us, most of the time we use. Um, event file has the lowest overhead of any of the ones that we're talking about, except for one other one we're going to talk about in a second. And it's going to look really familiar. We'll get to it in a second. The other one you might want to look at on a regular basis is histogram. And what's it going to do is it's going to create a way to have a running count. Remember we talked about having a count of store procedure calls. Histogram is a way to do that and have this tool maintain your running count. You will not have to have that running count yourself. You will not capture all the trace events, put it all out to a trace file, run a query to move the trace file into a database, then inside the database run queries against the um, store procedures to clear out the parameter values into a new field. So you just have the, the object IDs or an object names and then and you know and then run another query then to run counts against the object. <sighs> I'm tired. What if we just turned on histogram and captured counts on the fly? I like that. I'm lazy. I'm very lazy. That's a quick way to do it. There's also a thing called pair matching and it's a way I used to use this a lot more when I didn't understand what causality tracking did. We'll get around the causality tracking. And then there's ring buffer. Now ring buffer is the default and a lot of us will use that default out of the gate because it's easy. It's simple. You don't have to think. The problem is, is that that is adding some overhead to your system because it's adding it to the memory. Um, on systems that are under stress, I know like we already mentioned Jonathan Cajas, he is like, if that system's under stress, you will not use the ring buffer because it's going to cause more stress on the system. So it's, it's something to know. Generally, the event file is the way to go. Now, if you are outputting to the ring buffer and you're watching live data, you are adding more overhead to the system. But if you're outputting to a file and watching live data, guess what? That overhead is radically reduced. So generally, I would look at files. Now, the files, the setup is pretty bog standard. It's trace, guys. Here's the name. Here's a max size in gigabytes or megabytes. Enable rollover and set a max number of files. That's pretty familiar stuff. There's nothing to it. So we can click OK. You can add multiple targets. So if you wanted for one event to capture both um, an event file and a histogram, you could. Now, if we're capturing a histogram, we do have to do some definitions. So let's say we are interested in that store procedure count. So let's go in here and say, OK, RPC completed. We're not going to use action because that's going to be one of the actions. And, and so you'll see an action if we have any, but we don't have any. So what we're going to need is the fields. So we'll go to field.
and we can go to object name. And that's now going to group up to 256 buckets and you can define how many buckets you want. By the way, the bigger the buckets, guess what you're adding to? Memory. So you may wanna be cautious there, but we can add that too. There is an advanced screen. Don't worry about it. Um, there was a bug at one point that uh, for demos, I changed the mis dispatch latency to one. Um, thankfully the bug is gone. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. By and large, the advanced screen is only if you're really, really, really tweaking a big, big, big system in major ways. Since this is really mu very much about an introductory getting started thing, don't worry about it. Click OK and off it goes. And so we're now doing extended events. We're winning. Cool, we've got half an hour left, awesome. Plenty of time. So if I run this query, ta-da. And so it was a, and I know it was a store procedure that we ran, but we ran it from a batch. So it's going to be a batch complete that ran. So it's really easy to use. All you do is like every time you run it, let's just run it like two or three times. Uh, we'll just use go 50, run it there. If we go back to the live data, you can see there's 50 times. So if you want to see which one ran, all you've got to do is just click in here and then look down here until you find the one that you were interested in. Okay, so there's one. Anybody believe me that, that, that you have to click up here and then click down here and click up here and click down here? Um, if you do believe me, that's because you read my 2012 book and that's what I was doing because I'm an idiot. Um, I didn't know there was a silly thing called over here on the right hand side of the screen. Choose columns. Choose columns. Okay, cool. Oh, look, it's all of my event fields. Okay, well, hang on. Um, we're looking at SQL batch, so let's just add batch text. Now, we, we could add um, other stuff. If we had RPC complete, we could add in object name and all that fun stuff. But let's put in that. Let's put in um, duration. And let's put in logical reads. Cool. We can rearrange them in any order we want to. Just pick one and move it up or down. Uh, Timestamp, I don't really want to see that up front, so we're going to move it out to here. And um, cool, off we go. We can also add, we can merge columns or whatever. And we click OK. And now suddenly, oh wait, this makes sense. Now I understand. This is actually useful information. It's not garbage. Um, it's good stuff. We can resize these columns. Um, notice. You can see parameter values for all the ones we passed. You get to see the duration. You get to see the logical reads. We get to see all the data, and we can rearrange these any way we want to to put them up there and have them win. But it gets better. You can, over here again on the right, little button here, display settings. Open, open recent save as. What's that mean? Well, I can lay out a particular col set of columns the way I want to, get it exactly right, save it, and then share it with my team. So everybody can look at this data from these extended event sessions the same way. We can ensure that we're all getting the same information in a way that's easily consumed, and we can share it. Better still, watch this. If I close this, and where are we grouped by, right? And I say, okay, watch live data again. It remembers all the column settings that I provided for the session on my machine. Now, granted, that's on my machine. You would have to, in order to share it across machines or share it between team members, you would have to do a save as and then an open to get it out here. But for my machine, it remembers that I've got that set up the way I want it to. This is getting more and more useful. Now, it gets better. Let's, let's close this again. Time for a quick question? Sure, of course. In the event field for the statement for module n, does the does it display the input parameter value? But is there a way to display the parameter value for a nested procedure? So a way to display it for nested procedures? <sighs> yes and no. So it depends on the events you're capturing, but the way um, nested procedures are called, they're technically batch statements inside of a procedure. So you'd have to be capturing batch statements as well. But can you then capture them? Yes, you absolutely can. Thank you. Sure, not a problem. So if you'll notice, we've got both of the little output packages I asked for are all right here. And so I can open them up. 
So that's my histogram. And it's going to show values and counts. Now, right now, there isn't any because it hasn't been run right. But that's OK. We can right click the table to refresh. And if there's been any data run, we would see it. There hasn't been. So let's run some. Where, where's my query? Oops. There it goes. I somehow told it to go away. That was weird. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, we're still on RPC complete. Yeah, this isn't going to show, this is RPC complete. But you can see I can open it right up. Let's do this. Let's open up the event file for, ta-da, all of my information is there. And so I can pull it straight out of the file. I don't have to be watching live events. I can watch live events, but I could also instead just go directly to the file. This is while the extended event session is running. Yes, we can go in here and say, refresh and bring this up. But because we're now not watching live data, we get some new functionality, such as, hey, you know what? Let's sort it by um, longest running query. Oh, there we go. Now that at the top is the longest running query, 28 um, microsecond, 28,000 microseconds, um, 28 milliseconds. Cool. Well, what, wait, hang on. Let, let's look at, um, well, logical reads are all going to be the same. Can we sort by timestamp? Sure, we can. Could we sort by batch text? Sure, we can. We've got the capability of sorting this stuff quick and easy. Now, if this is 100 million rows, how quickly is and quickly and easily is it going to sort? Not that quickly and easily, right? Nothing's magic, nothing's free, but it's cool. However, 100 million rows is kind of much to deal with. So you know what? Let's do this. Let's go in and filter. We can filter the data that we're looking at. So we could say, hey, you know what? Let's look at a time filter. Now, we've only been running it for five minutes. So the amount of time that we can filter by is fairly limited. But we could say, you know, let's only look at two minutes of the five minutes. And we can do that. Or we could say, you know, okay, show me this field. And then, you know, uh, where, let's say, duration is greater than um, greater than, we'll say 4,000. So for the first two minutes this thing was running, only show me the fields where duration was greater than 4,000. Okay. <sighs> Try doing that in Profiler. <laughs> Good luck. This is so simple and easy. It gets better. What if we're doing this? Let's say, let's say you're working on a book with Hugo. And he doesn't take it that you say, hey, this query ran an average in about five milliseconds. He doesn't want to hear that. He says, no, no, no. The only way to tell is if you've run it 50 times or 100 times, like we just did, right? I just want to point that out. We just did that. And yeah, I'm picking on Hugo. <laughs> She's really not picking on Hugo because Hugo picked on me. Um, this is, this is self-defense. What if we say, okay, well, I'm not going to take the average. Well, yeah, I am. I'm going to take the average. I'm going to group by. And I'm going to group by the batch text. Any of the columns that I've got up here, I can then group by. So I'll group by batch text. So there is my query that's been run 50 times. And in this case, it's 10 because we filtered it. But well, let me just add some aggregations and say, OK, duration, the average, and click OK. And so now we know that the average is 7,500 microseconds, so 7.5 milliseconds. So when I tell Hugo it's 7.5 milliseconds on average, it's 7.5 milliseconds on average. And so I've got the multiple executions to support that. It's an easy, quick way to display data that we did not have before. This is beyond anything that we've ever had. I mean, let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's clear all the filters. Let's clear the aggregation and the grouping. Right, let's get rid of all that mess. And so now we're back to the raw data. You know what else you could do? You could say, you know what? I want to compare this execution to another execution. Let me toggle the bookmark. So I've got that. And then we'll come back up here and look at this execution and toggle a bookmark. And then I can move between the bookmarks to look at this data. Guys, this changes the way we can explore the information available to us. We are no longer dependent upon going out to files and then loading the files to tables and then cleaning the data in tables and then taking the stuff from the tables and it. 
that's a lot of work and I'm lazy, right? I want to be quick, simple, agile. This is the way to go. It gets better because this is not just the GUI thing. Let's also talk about some of the functionality. Let's talk about the idea of say, I don't know, behavior in queries. Let's take a look at the properties of the session I've got running. By the way, Hugo says he got paid to pick on you and you're giving it away for free. You're so <laughs> I do love that man. I will not lie. He's great. Oh wait, no, that's performance. That's the wrong one. I opened the wrong one. Behavior grant, not performance. Now this one, the reason I'm bringing this one up is it's got causality tracking turned on. And so I want to focus on what causality tracking is going to give us because it changes the game just a bit. So in this case, what I'm capturing is auto stats events, um, batch completed events, batch starting events, SQL statement completed, SQL statement recompiles, and SQL statement starting events, all these different ones, all at the same time, okay? Now, because I'm only running this on, on my local container, uh, and by the way, this runs on containers, um, and oh yeah, by the way, it runs on Linux, and you know, but anyway, the reason, so I'm only running this locally, there's not a whole lot of load going on, so just imagine, if you will, there's a massive load going on while we're running this query, and now let's watch query behavior, we'll watch the live data again. Now, notice it lays it all out in the, in the um, columns and stuff that I'd already wanted up on the screen, so I could see it the way I wanted to see it. Cool, that's awesome. And then we're gonna do some stupid stuff. What we're gonna do is we're gonna move the entire population of the planet to a city called Fornaboo um, and then run this query, okay? Nice and simple. And for those who are now asking at home, wait, 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 what was that? I'm not gonna tell you. You have to look up Redgate software. <laughs> So what happened is, is that query executed and a whole bunch of stuff has happened. And you can see a whole mess here and there's a whole lot of things going on. You can see that there was an auto stats event fired, a st recompile statement fired, various statements started and completed. And if you think about a production server where this query was running along with 10,000 other queries, how do we have any way to correlate which of these events happened in what order? Well with a little tiny bit of extra overhead, we can add in causality tracking. Causality tracking will identify batches of events that are related to one another, that are caused by one another. And it will assign an activity GUID, right? So we've got the activity GUID here. We make sure that that's part of our column up above. What we do is we pause the live data by hitting stop. Now that's not changing the extended event session, it's still running but we're stopping the collection of data to my screen. We pause that and then we go to grouping and we say group by activity GUID. And so now we're gonna see that there's only two because again, we're running locally. And so there's not much to see, 16 and four. On the 16, if we open this up, we get to see all of the events and activity GUID has got a sequence. So we get to see the events and the sequence in which they occurred. So batch starting, well, the batch started, um, it gives us the batch text and we can see what that is. Cool, that's nice. Statement starting, well, each statement begin tran, um, the next you know, statement completed, begin tran. Next statement is update person, okay, cool. Statement completed, update person. Statement started, um, execute stored procedure, cool. Statement recompile, oh no, what happened? We had a recompile event. Why did we have a recompile event? Well, we can take a look at the recompile events cause and it says, hey, statistics changed. Why? Because we moved everyone to Fornaboo. Well, when statistics change, that means a recompile event. If a recompile event is occurring, that's when statistics get updated. That's why we're seeing the auto stats occur. And, and, and we're seeing the order in which the auto stats are occurring. We get to see exactly the order in which they're occurring. So it's first it's updating the system generated store um, statistics, then the address, um, the alternate key, um, then the um, index for the address and then the other index. And so it's updating a series of indexes. Then it's saying, hey, wait a minute, 
Let's finish up the statement so it completes the statement. So what we've done here is not simply capture query metrics. Query metrics is easy, right? And, and honest to God, if, if it was just about query metrics, use trace, right? It's boring, but it's there. It causes more overhead, but it's workable. You know, it's slower and more painful to use compared to this, but you know it well, so use it. No, 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 no. I want to see the behavior of the system and the order in which things occurred so I can track and identify why I'm seeing particular kinds of behaviors. And by enabling something like the um, you know, auto stats and the statement recompiles, I get to see explicitly when each of those things would have occurred within the processes occurring within the query execution. That is impossible through trace. This is new knowledge advanced beyond what you can get easily any other way. So this is just irretrievably irreplaceable, right? I mean, this is all new information that you're not going to get any other way. And because you can pull it into the screen, do easy filtering, quickly aggregate it, you can get to it easily and simply. So this is why I'm actively, actively encouraging people to move to team extended events. We've got stuff going on, right? I mean, it's that easy just to talk about. There's just so much more you can do, so much better, so much easier. Let me give you one more, and then we'll just go to Q&A for the rest of the session. Down here, there's a session running on all of your machines right now, unless you have explicitly disabled it. It's right here. It's system health. It's running all day, every day on your systems. It's got a, it's got a log file. It is the SQL Server black box. Let me just show you what's inside of it because I really, really want you to know that you've got a fallback right now for certain events that you probably want a fallback for. Oops. Oh, I hit live data. I hit properties. Silly, silly man. Let's go and look at properties. Okay, I've got several questions that have piled up if you want okay. me to start asking. We'll get to those we'll get to those in just one second, I promise. Okay. Let's let me get this one little bit done and then we'll and then we'll go just to questions and nothing else. Um, okay, no problem. No, no, no worries. No worries. You know me. I'm easy. I know. Um, very easy. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to configure because that way I can find the one I want rather quickly, I hope. Yeah, there we go. So there's an event right here called wait info. And that wait info has got a filter. And it's a whole bunch of different particular weights that it's filtering out. Um, so if it's saying, you know, if it's something other than this, something other than that, not this, not that. And then finally, if the duration is greater than 30 seconds. Right now on your systems today, if you have weights longer than 30 seconds, there is an event firing inside of system health that you can go in and capture and see, hey, you know that query that ran long yesterday, ran longer than 30 seconds? We can go find it. Now, maybe yesterday, maybe not. It depends on the rollover of the files and how, how busy your systems are. But you've got a long running query thing now in your systems. Nothing you have to do to set it up, it's there. One more bit, and then, then we'll go straight to um, 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 questions. Also there is XM, the XML deadlock report the full-blown XML deadlock report. You do not have to go into your horrific error file and run through scripts to figure out what deadlocks are going on. Instead, you can run a simple query, which I'm going to show you right now. Oops. I'm going to show you right now. There is a simple query. It's fairly simple anyway. Let's find it. Yeah, there's really nothing to it. We do have to get the path where the system files are being stored in your system, okay? So we're gonna go in and get dosdlc.path, cool. Um, we're gonna look for system underscore health, cool. We're then going to do a cast from fn xe file target read file so we can read extended events files. It's gonna put it out as XML. Oh no, it's XML. Yeah, it's a really complicated XML query to get the full deadlock graph. All I have to do is provide the X path, event data value deadlock, and then deal query dot, and it outputs the full deadlock graph for, the query, for this event. That's all I have to do. Uh, 
why would anyone use trace ever again the rest of their lives? There is so much more capability here that's at your fingertips. And I just can't can't get over it. Okay, cool. Let's talk, let's talk questions. Okay, that right there answered a few questions because people okay. are asking about deadlock graphs. <laughs> sure. Well, and also by the way, it will it will display if you're watching live data. Um, if you capture execution plans, it will show the execution plans here. Um, if you are capturing deadlock graphs, you can look at the dead the, the graphical deadlock graph here. Um, but the uh, but the deadlock XML is also available, so you can get both. I think, like I said, I think that takes care of at least three questions. Cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you have a query with different parameters, how do you group the query? Okay, cool. Are we talking about a batch, a statement, or a stored procedure? If it's a stored procedure, the answer is really simple. Object name, done. If it's a batch or a statement, it gets weird, right? Because you can't really aggregate easily on a batch because it's a hundred statements, you know? So there's not going to be a simple way to do that. On statements, of course you can aggregate on them, but depending on the parameter values passed, you may or may not see, you know, see good ag aggregation. It's not going to do everything in a flawless fashion all the time. Um, it, it's, it's a query, right? So if you ran the same thing through trace, you'd be hitting the same kind of issues. You either have to clean out parameter values or you have to aggregate and, and let the parameter values go together. Can we watch live in, in um, data and extended events without a target? There's always a target um, no matter what. If you give it no target, it's going to buffer and that means you watch you start watching um, live data through through the buffer. Let's see, can you use this to monitor server level changes? Oh yeah, I don't think I have it. Do I have it? I do. Yeah, here. Um, I've got one right here. There's, there's a whole bunch more I could show you on this, but this one's simple enough. Um, it, it give you the idea. What this one's doing is um, database attach, database detach. Oh, hang on, I can zoom in there. Database created, database dropped. Um, I can monitor all of the changes to databases. Every single aspect of a database, um, whether or not they created, dropped, um, or changed, and, and even some alter commands, um, database started, database stopped, um, adding log files, removing log files, all that fun, fun stuff. Log files automatically growing, log files shrinking. Um, I've got all that stuff tracked through there. I can see database behavior in a way I never could before. Um, but yeah, we can also track um, object changes, alter statements. Um, um, yeah, I mean, just, woo, it just keeps going. Okay. What's the next question? Uh, the extended events, deadlocks, graphs, and related XML, you've already answered that. Yeah, yeah. He's talking about changes to the server itself, not individual databases, I guess, like, you know, max stop type stuff. Yeah, you can capture that kind server of stuff. Server level. Yep. Okay. Yep, yep. yep. I, don't, I don't have an example of that one. But I mean, technically, this is server level changes, right? Drop database is a server change. Yeah. Technically. So, can, I mean, yeah. It tracks just about everything. Um, can you track the use of a table inside of a stored procedure review? And everyone asks this one. So everyone asks this one. Okay, so yes and no. Um, let's say that we're looking at a batch file. Um, all you have to do is, is provide a filter, look for the table name inside the batch text. Done. It's, it's, that's it. Now, is that an efficient filter? Um, it might actually be a somewhat painful filter, right? Nothing's free. We're, you know, there's no such thing as free, but um, it will do that. So you can filter it by that table name. Now, what you can't do is filter by table name inside of a stored procedure. So, in, so instead then, if, you're, if you want to track a table, you have to first identify the stored procedures you're interested in, filter by those stored procs, and then you will know which time the table gets hit. Cool. Uh, can you use it to track security changes such as adding users, events, permissions? No, stuff? no, it will not track security. Yes, yes, it tracks security change. I'm kidding. Of course, it tracks security changes. Like, what? He's, he's, he's just going, you're not right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, when did audit get created inside a SQL server? Anybody know? <laughs> was that 2000, 2008? 2008, yeah. And, and why did it come out in 2008? Because audit is Probably using extended events. Extended events. Audit's using extended events. So yeah, you can you definitely track track security changes. 
So I have a server that has a configuration manager that's required to use encryption. Someone, not a DBA, turned it off, which I have, haven't discovered it. All right. Would have gotten got me in trouble. trouble. <laughs> could Can you, I use this to monitor, monitor and figure out who okay. did it in the could future? You, okay, so could you monitor for it? Yes. Could you figure out who did it? Not necessarily. And this is a, not a shortcoming with extended events, a shortcoming with SQL Server. Because every individual, individual user, regardless of who they are, um, is not required to have an individual sign in to SQL Server, login, user, whatever. Um, it is dependent upon your security levels as to whether or not you're going to be able to do this. So let, let's say you're in a, in a situation where I've been in, where every single person right down to the receptionist has SA privileges. Yay, that's a great job, by the way. I lasted nine months. Um, me too. <laughs> the, um, yeah, that made me insane. The ability to track who did what goes away because everyone's logged in the same way and they all have the same level of permissions. And so unless it's in the connection string, and there are ways to capture what's in the connection string through extended events, um, unless it's in the connection string, no, there's no way to do it. And it just stinks. Um, can you measure the... Um, XE impact itself. Yeah, primarily through weight statistics. You can't you can't really use XE to monitor XE, but um, you can monitor through um, weight statistics and see what's going on. And by the way, you know, I mean, I, I emphasize that there's overhead and I emphasize that there, you know, that there's cost associated with the stuff, but it is really low most of the time, unless you're doing stuff like capturing execution plans through this um, execution plans are it's a costly operation no matter what and so it adds overhead um, if you're doing lots of pair matching that adds overhead causality tracking can add some overhead depending on all the other events that you're capturing and how much it has to keep track of you know it's again it, the more you stack into it yeah it begins to add overhead but for basic monitoring and basic configuration stuff no, just turn it on. You're fine. You're fine. You'll be okay. Let's see. We got um, four minutes left. Okay. Well, and I got, I got, I got like another a, window too. I got, I got, <laughs> so, and I got 90 seconds of slides left. So, so let's keep going. Uh, okay. Uh, someone wants to know about wait sets not being cleared on restart. How do we do that? There's a yeah. blog post that somebody's done about capturing yeah. into a table from SQL Skills, I think. So I would check their website. Yeah, I would do that. That would be of my best events. answer. Although, although, by the way, you can like, how, how would you like to see every weight for a given query group the same way we did the auto stats here? You can do that through extended events. Um, oh. There's. How do you know when you're experiencing weight. issues with performance issues with extended events? It, it'll show up in the weight stats. And it'll, okay. it'll be memory and IO most of the time. Why does. Why does a system health session have both event file and ring buffer targets? Um, so that you can query it from the ring buffer if you want to. And, and you know, I mean, Microsoft can answer more than that because I didn't set it up, but, but it's so you can <laughs> query it from the ring buffer or the file. Can you track SQL Server timeouts? And if so, what events would you monitor? Yes, you can capture timeouts. Um, generally, timeouts is where I would probably look at pair matching as a way to do it, but there's also another event I don't remember the one, but there's another event that can actually do timeouts. It'll it'll tell you that you've had a timeout. Um, it, there is it's a comment on my blog, and I couldn't even tell you where to look. Um, but but if you search around, you'll find it. I promise. Someone wants to know if they can get an email for a query that's been running longer than two hours. Sure. Sure. Someone wants you to know that Forney Boo is not a city. It's a former main airport in Oslo. SQL okay. prompt saves lives, not jobs. <laughs> Um, do you have to have any uh, trace flags enabled to be able to get the deadlocks like 1204 no, and 1222? No, no, no. No, that's the beauty of this. Let's say the server, you set up the server and you forgot to put the deadlock graph on. I mean, the, the deadlock thing. I don't care. I'm just going to go into system health. Probably for most of my systems, I'm just going to go into system health anyway. Um, can you capture, I'm going to combine these two questions, DDL triggers and DML changes with the... Uh, with the with uh, extended events, certainly seem to be the same. Yeah, you can. It, it gets. <sighs> Short answer, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Long answer, it depends, and and the the it depends is way more time than we have right now. Okay. Uh, does it does it capture host name, i.e., computer name? That's going to be a yes. As long as that's connect, as long as it's part of the connection string. 
if it's oh, not th there's ways that you can bypass that and then you, and then it, sql server doesn't know and so extended events isn't magic if sql server doesn't oh. know extended events doesn't know okay last one can you suggest a good source of extended event session definitions look at the screen <laughs> i i knew that was coming that's why i went ahead and said last one Look at the screen. Um, this is a blog post I put up recently. Um, and, and it's, yes, okay, I'm telling you to go to my blog. But what I'm telling you to go to my blog for is to get the list of links to other people's blogs. This is a whole bunch of stuff. Um, Eric Darling's working on a tool. Um, um, DBA Tools has got a whole bunch of ways to get around the XML. Uh, DBA Tools is awesome, right? Um, Jason Brimhall has got all the blog posts known to mankind. Um, um, Gianluca has also got another tool that he's working on for extended events. And then all of these other people have got these amazing posts on all these different functionalities for, for monitoring TempDB, for monitoring, you know, all these different things that, that are pain points that we've always been dealing with, but we never had a good way to look at them. There it is. There's a list. You go to scarydba.com, look up extended events. You will find this list of community resources. I am promoting these people. Um, I'm sending it to my blog just because it's an easy central place, but this is what I'm promoting is these people. Track these people down and get their information. We are out of time. Hopefully we hit these goals and you guys know a little bit more about extended events than you did today. I do not want to step on Mike's time. So I am done. Here's my contact info. Please use it. Thank you. Next Yay. time you exchange beers over our nine month jobs. Cool. Oh, yeah. I'd love to have that. Sure, we both have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about yours and you can hear about mine. Awesome. All right. Well, everybody's I'll get out of here. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Everybody's no, just no. saying thank you. Well, no. Well, thank them. Um, hopefully this was helpful and hopefully they learned a few.